Oxygen Blast Technical Seminars are an Intertech production. For instructor-led.net, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com. Now, let's look at some more practical parts of XAML. This is the part that you need to understand the basic syntax because you'll certainly need to go back and tweak things every now and again, no matter how good a tool might be, such again, you know, Bland or Visual Studio. You might want to go back and optimize the markup. Maybe you just find it quicker to just retype something as opposed to using all the visual tools. And there are a couple of aspects of working with XAML that are a little different than your typical XML document. So that's the part I want to focus on here. The first thing I want to do is I want to talk about these weird, mysterious XML namespaces. Okay, these can make people kind of wonder, you know, what the heck's going on with this? As a very good rule of thumb, every single XAML file that you create in the root element will always have these two XML namespaces. And I'll tell you why. The root XML namespace the one that ends with the word presentation. That is basically a way to import through markup all of these core WPF.net namespaces. So that little string, that actually means something, right? If you were to look inside of the WPF libraries, Windows Base, Presentation Core, Presentation Foundation, you would actually find some assembly level attributes that say, hey, if I find this big string, that's going to be mapping to these different .NET namespaces. And that's why if I were to go to my Visual Studio Editor, let's go back here. You know, I did a drag and drop operation to get that button on here. But I could also do it just through typing directly in the editor. So if I were to come back over here. Right, so you can see I can start to get some IntelliSense so it knows what a button is. Well, the reason that it knows what a button is is because I have that root XAML namespace that ends in presentation. Because this string is effectively bringing in system.windows.controls. Now the other one that has the X tag prefix, see how that ends in the word XAML? That is basically giving you access to what you can kind of consider XAML keywords. So if we're trying to get anything in that XAML namespace, we got to prefix the letter X. If I can just go backwards, did you notice over here how the code attribute said X colon code? Well, that's because the code element is part of that XAML namespace. Another good reason for tool support, right? It'd be pretty tedious if we always had to remember which tag prefix to use for all these different things. Because in many cases, you know, you might have a production level WPF window. There's going to be a lot more of these little mappings beyond the two that we see here. You know, it's very common to define your own tag prefixes if you're trying to point to controls in a custom library, for example. So if we have a good tool, it'll generate that you know, markup for us through drag and drop operations. Here's an example of where you might put together your own XML namespaces. Let's say, for example, you wanted to describe in markup something in the system namespace of MS Core Lib. Well, you can do that. You just got to build up a tag prefix. So check that out, right? You see that little CLR dash namespace? Okay, that's mandatory. That is a token that says, I'm trying to map to some namespace in an assembly, which is not part of that default set I get from here. Okay? If you're trying to define something in XAML, which is part of the current program, it just happens to be in a different namespace, you do a very similar thing but you don't have to say assembly equal. 
as we did for MS Core Live. Now, a little FYI for you folks, where would you find that very, very useful? Again, you're trying to, you know, one of your coworkers built a WPF control library. You want to reference it in your project and then describe one of the objects in markup. First thing you got to do, you got to make a tag prefix. In this chart, these are some of the other things that we get from that XAML namespace. Remember, because they're all coming from that XAML namespace, we typically always want to prefix that letter X in front of the, the element. There are actually a couple of shortcuts in some cases, but generally speaking, if you want any of these items in your markup, you got to do the X colon. Now, for this little video tutorial, I'm not going to get into all these pieces here. I do just want to give you a taste of what you can do with the XAML namespace. And let me just skip ahead for a second and then I'll go back. But let me just show you one example. I'm going to actually copy this to my clipboard. And I'm going to go back to Kazaml. And I think, let's see, let me do this. Then I'll put him here. Sorry, just doing a little bit of cleanup. There we go. Okay, check it out. What I've just done is I've defined an XML namespace. Let me just zoom this in here. Okay, called CoreLib. Now CoreLib is pointing where the system.NET namespace of MS CoreLib. Okay, that part we already talked about. But here's the idea of some of these XAML tokens. You see here where I say X colon static? This is actually something called a markup extension. You see how everything inside of that double quoted string is encased in curly brackets? That is a markup extension. And the easiest way to, to think of these markup extensions, they're a way for you to get a value which is not known until runtime to assign it to an object. Classic examples, data binding, right? Data binding is all about markup extensions. Another good example might be a custom control template, right? Um, other good examples could be object resources. Well, here, what X colon static does is it says, hey, I'm trying to invoke somebody's static property to get the data that I need to set the content of these labels. Well, Remember my tag prefix, right? So that really is saying system dot environment dot machine name, OS version, and processor count. So up here, right, I'd be able to see that sure enough, I'm displaying real time processors, version of Windows, and the name of this computer. So pretty interesting stuff, right? I'm able to go ahead and invoke static items through markup. Let me flip back to where we just were. All right, so that what I just showed you guys there was I was trying to illustrate one of these little XAML tokens in action. So we just looked at the static, okay? Plenty of other ones you can get into as well. And in the full class, we do kind of go through each option so you see what's possible. But believe, believe it or not, it's actually useful stuff. Now, here's the first bit of syntax, which is a little different than your typical XML document. This is one that's really important to know about, right? Did you notice here when you're defining an element, everything seems to be captured as string data. Height equal quote 100 quote, right? Well, certainly you can probably already imagine something has to be happening here because the height property, it doesn't want a string, it wants a number. Well, WPF is a whole bunch of built-in type converters that just work in the background. So there is something which will actually take that string and parse out the correct underlying double data type, right? But if you can capture your data as a simple string, go for it. 
Sometimes it's not that easy though. What if you said, I'm trying to define something in markup, and I'm trying to set this property, but the trick is, the value of the property, I can't capture it as a string, because it's a complex object all by itself. Well then, we have a special syntax for that, called property element syntax. For more free learning resources and to see the latest lineup of our instructor-led .NET, Java, and XML courses, visit us at www.intertech.com.